Hello everyone, welcome back. So we have second talk of the day. D and D and G, a daring tale of uh, dungeons and dragons and also graphs by Mohammad Adar. Over to you, Mohammad. Hey everybody, thanks for being patient with me. It's hard to stand. Uh, I'm usually not this rude, uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so since I have mostly spent my career in large corporations and my brain is broken, I have to give you an agenda. And we're just gonna uh, really quickly talk about myself, uh, do some level setting about where you guys are at, and then I'm gonna very briefly introduce graphs and why they're really cool and why they matter. And then I'm gonna talk about a handful of algorithms that I've divided into uh, three different classes. So yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, if you wanna follow along in this presentation, you can check out my link tree. It's just uh, Muhammad Athar. Um, and it's got a link to a PDF of the presentation and some other stuff. I'll be adding to that, so you know, check back occasionally. Um, so yeah, uh, amongst my many, many interests, I really think uh, graphs are neat. Obviously, I like Python. Um, I like drawing and DMing sometimes, so this is a nice little intersection of all of those. About you, um, hopefully you've got some programming under your belt. This isn't gonna be a real coding heavy presentation, so that should be all right. If you don't, <coughs> um, Hopefully you're familiar with uh, maps or dictionaries in Python. You know, real basic object-oriented stuff, nothing too hardcore there. Um, there will be some matrices here. Uh, if you aren't familiar with those, don't worry. You can always circle back to them and learn them later, or uh, just don't use them and use something else because graphs are flexible like that. So people who are familiar with graphs may recognize uh, this map of the city of Konigsberg. And um, that's a classic problem in graph theory that uh, presented a, a city separated by a river. And in between the river, or in the river, there are two land masses. So that's four land masses connected by seven bridges. And the question was, uh, can you take a, a tour of the city and cross each bridge exactly once? Um, I'd rather motivate graphs by asking you about your friend group. And if I was to ask you about your friend group, you probably wouldn't tell me uh, like a bullet point list of you know, their name and date of birth and height and stuff like that. You're more likely going to tell me about their, um, you know, you'll probably tell me a story of something like, oh, this is uh, you know, my friend Alice, who I met uh, through our mutual friend Bob at a party thrown by Claire um, where I uh, lost a whole bunch of money to my friend Dan and Ellen. Um, and what that is, <clears throat> is um, you're, you're describing these people and the relationships you have with those people. And that's what's really exciting about graphs, is they're a data structure that can codify systems as entities and relationships. And um, you know a lot of other data structures uh, purport to do that, but graphs treat these relationships as first-class members, and that's where their uh, strength really lies. And two special relationships that they can encode um, particularly well are directional relationships, where, for example, um, a friendship type of relationship is two-directional, right? If you're friends with someone, you kind of assume they're friends with you. But if you're following someone, say on like Twitter or um, something like that, then they don't necessarily have to follow you. And that's where uh, graphs are really useful as far as, as far as encoding directional relationships. There's also transitive relationships. And the uh, example I like to use to motivate this is if a um, ad company made like a viral video and then paid to put it up on Twitter. And if uh, you really liked it, um, and you retweeted it, but you weren't really in the market for their product, that ad campaign is a failure using classic analytics. But if you um, dig a little deeper into this, your friend may have seen the video, been in the market for that product, and bought it. And so you can use graph analytics 
to encode those transitive relationships and uh, dig a little deeper into the success or failure of any particular ad campaign or other relationships. Uh, this is a more classic illustration of a graph. It's uh, essentially, the, the more formal definition is that a graph is a collection of nodes and edges. Nodes are just the fundamental atomic unit in a graph, and then edges are um, pairs of nodes that represent a connection between them. Um, for example, we have, uh, you know, the, where's my cursor? There it is, node A, uh, C, B, and D here. We have edges between them. We can also have uh, directed edges, and that's just in a uh, directed graph, and your edges would have to be ordered pairs then. Um, one thing I really want to talk about but couldn't figure out how to uh, wedge into this conversation or into this presentation is pads and subgraphs. They're really useful tools. So if you're doing graph analytics, um, you'll definitely want to be familiar with that. And a path is just what it sounds like. It's um, just a, a collection of nodes um, and you uh, get a, oh, I lost my cursor. There it is. You get a starting node and an ending node and you get a path through other nodes to get to that ending node. And then a subgraph is just a portion of a graph. Um, and so these will be really useful if you ever do graph analytics more. But um, the last little awkward thing that I want to cover is labels, uh, which are a way to uh, describe the class of a node. So for example, in this graph, we've got either servers or clients, um, and that's a label. But you can also add a property to any graph. And that's any other information. And that's where the real strength of graphs comes in, because you can add a name, or a model, or the amount of free space on a particular machine, or the latency between two machines, and stuff like that, and really start doing some really cool analytics and um, exploit your data a little further. Um, as far as applications, they're everywhere. Uh, if you're here, hopefully you're already excited about that. But you've probably seen them in uh, you know, maps, social networks, Puzzle solving in state spaces, uh, disease propagation, community identification, chemical, I'm not going to read this. You guys can read it later. It's, there's, it's everywhere. Um, OK, so this is PyCon. So I'm going to very briefly cover representing graphs in Python. You can use um, either an adjacency or degree matrix, an edge list, a dictionary, or you can use packages like NetworkX. Uh, and so when you have a matrix representation, a matrix is just really a table of numbers. You let your rows represent the from node, and your columns represent the to node. So for example, um, you know, we got the number 2 over here. So that's uh, from A to D. And we have uh, two edges from A to D. So the number in the table represents the number of edges. You'll see that along the diagonal, there's, uh, no there's all zeros, because uh, none of these nodes connect to themselves. And um, one more thing is you'll see that this matrix is symmetric. For example, uh, from A to B is 1, but from B to A is also 1, because there's one edge from A to B and from B to A, because this graph is undirected. Uh, just be careful if you're using directed graphs, because the matrix won't be symmetric, and um, certain assumptions fall apart. And that just looks like a list in Python. If you want to get fancy, you can use a NumPy array. Um, you can also just use an edge list, which is just pairs. One thing to note here is that I've got the edge CD in here twice. That's because there are two edges from C to D. Um, dictionaries are nice. They're uh, better for directed graphs. This is, there's a lot of redundancy in this one because I want to represent the same graph over and over. But they're also nice because you can use um, you know, any hashable object as the key to your dictionary. So depending on how you write up a uh, custom node class, you can just use that object as the key and just have a, a list of the actual nodes. Uh, or you, know, you can make your own custom made node objects and your own graph objects and throw your logic in there. Uh, as much as I love graphs, they aren't great for everything, right? If you're uh, exploring graphs, uh, and graph databases especially, avoid them if you've got a lot of writes, if you have a you know, write-heavy he write system. Um, or if you're querying large parts of a database, you lose a lot of the efficiencies that graphs provide. OK, so let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, quick disclaimer, D&D uh, is inherently racist. Uh, this is something that uh, Wizards of the Coast is addressing, but um, it's baked in there. And so if that's something that bothers you, I've tried very hard to uh, not have representation, representations like that in here, but I'm not perfect. 
Um, so if it does, please let me know because I'm always trying to be better. Um, it's not inherently violent, but there sometimes tends to be violence in D&D &D adventures. So I've also tried to minimize that. Uh, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So you meet in the, uh, uh, you know, you meet in a tavern and you want to get a lager because the ales are gross. But, and the bar is all the way up here, but you're all the way down here. And so you need to get through this very busy bar. And you're like, you know what, no problem. I'm just gonna start walking, but you come to a fork in the road. And so now you're like, oh man, okay. Well, I'm just gonna go down a random fork. I don't know, whichever one. But that means you uh, end up hitting a dead end, right? Because you run into this nice, I don't know, it's like a dog woman person. This is the only picture I didn't draw, so I don't know everything in it. Um, the guy, I did credit him in the first one. Noah QH, check him out, you know, support artists. Um, so yeah, anyways, you uh, run into this obstacle. So you end up backtracking to the intersection and you go down uh, one of the other options in the fork in the road. And you basically can keep doing that until you get to the bar. And in the worst case scenario, your trip will look something like this. You know, you start over here, you come to an intersection and you um, just make a decision. And if that decision leads you to a dead end, then you backtrack and you try another path. And this is known as depth first search. Oh, just kidding, I need to practice more. First, I'm gonna tell you about converting maps to graphs. Um, you can treat the, uh, the corridors as edges and entities and the um, intersections as nodes. And so this is sort of less naturally than a lot of other things, but does naturally turn into a graph. And so you've got your uh, nodes that I've just labeled alphabetically and then dead end nodes I've just labeled as an X and then you have your edges connecting those nodes. And you can use depth first search, which is a nice, simple, recursive algorithm that is um, you know, quick to implement, easy to use, yada yada. Um, yeah, I can run through this. Do we have time? Yeah, we got time. Ooh. Okay. Um, the way depth first search runs, it's recursive, right? So you always kind of want to put that end condition there at the beginning. And then um, one little gotcha that I, always threw me off is uh, to make sure you mark your current node as visited. Uh, just the way these algorithms work is they will build lists of unvisited nodes and if you don't mark them as visited, you're going to end up going in loops. Um, and then you basically just check every node um, if it is the target node, uh, you know, just recurse into it. So what that looks like, I wanted to go through just one or two iterations here. We'll uh, start at the node down at the bottom that we've marked as visited. It's not the endpoint, so we're going to mark it as visited and then we're going to uh, check every one of its unvisited neighbors, right? And we're gonna perform DFS by going basically to the top of this, and this isn't the endpoint, so we're not going to return true here. We are going to mark it as visited, and then for every one of its neighbors, we're going to just recurse further in. And so eventually you uh, end up recursing through the whole thing and getting to the end, and you can finally order a beer. And, or a non-alcoholic beer if you're under 21 in America. Um, but as you're ordering your beer, a little street urchin comes up to you and asks you for help. And you're like, oh, you know what? I'm there. I'm here to answer the call to adventure. And you get kicked out of the bar for drawing a weapon in the middle of a bar and everybody's just trying to have a good time. So he leads you to the sewers where there's been trouble, but it's locked. So you're like, ah, I gotta find a key. And he's all like, you know what? Don't worry. I think either Alice or Bob have the key. It's a weird town, everyone's names are alphabetically ordered. Um, so you're like, you know what, that's fine, I'll just go ask Alice and see if she's got the key. And Alice is like, I don't have the key, but maybe you can ask Carmen or Dev. And you're like, okay, you know what, that's fine, but first I gotta ask Bob. And Bob is like, I don't have the key either and my face looks like toast, so maybe ask Ellen. Um, and so then you're like, all right, I'm gonna add Ellen to my list, but I first gotta go see Carmen. And Carmen is like, I don't have the key either, go ask Bob. And this is where things start running circles and you're like, this is ridiculous. Why, why am I you know, just going down the list like this, asking people um, when I have the magic of graphs to help me organize this search? And so if we revisit this search by treating uh, people as nodes, the uh, edges between each node represent the relationships between those people. So this could be relationships like Alice knows Bob, Alice follows Bob, or Alice and Bob are friends with each other, or Alice thinks Bob has the key, which is the relationship we're gonna use. So let's revisit this problem using, um, oh man, I have 15 minutes left, holy cow. I thought this was a 45 minute presentation. 
Dang. Guys, breath first search is great. Do it. <laughs> All right. So one thing, you want to make sure your mark your nose is visited. This is actually, yeah, you're, you're crossing them off off the top. So when Carmen finally tells you to go visit Bob, you're like, ha, ah, I already took care of that. Don't, don't even trip, dog. And then um, what else do you need to know about breath first search? Oh, this is cool too, because as you're uh, solving a problem, you, uh, you can build the graph on the fly. So that's cool. Um, you don't have to know everything about the graph as you're solving whatever problem you're solving. And that's another thing I really like about graphs is they are, more than any other database, really open to modifying things on the fly. Um, that's breath first search. Breath first search. Everyone knows it. Look it up. It's great. Um, so yeah, your mark knows it's visited. This is another thing. Uh, this is what depth first search would look like along this network. And then this is what breath first search would look like. And it's cool because you can kind of uh, get to whatever solution in like as few as jumps as possible. Whereas with depth first search, you kind of have to go to the end of a particular path. So that's um, definitely something you want to keep in your back pocket is breath first search is the way to go for most simple things. So you get the key, you uh, are in the sewer, there's a map, and uh, you're like, you know what, no problem. I've already converted maps to graphs and I've done breath first search. I can get there in two hops, easy. And so you run off and the kid's looking at you like you're an idiot and he beats you there and you're like, what? And he's like, I know a faster way from a wizard named Dykstra because you didn't think about the path lengths. And so if you consider the path lengths, you can get a uh, faster path just because if you go from S to A to B, right, you're gonna go along this big corridor versus if you take a little detour from S to A to, or excuse me, S to A to E. If you take a detour from S to A to B, you can take B to E, which is shorter. And um, that's a really great algorithm that I'd love to talk you through sometime. But there it is. This, this is all in the PowerPoint. I, uh, yeah, if you guys want to know about it, that's one thing about this is uh, you just want to repeat it until you mark your targeted note as visited. It's a little gotcha if you're doing Dijkstra, don't end too early. And then you go into the evil guy's lair and you make Batman noises. And you find a, um, turns out this guy wasn't really a you know, big bad. He's just a messenger. And so now you have a whole list of uh, people or a whole bunch of messages that people have been sending to each other. And so you, uh, you, know, you say Frank's messaging Gina, Gina's messaging Hector, and so on and so on, and that's getting real confusing. So you turn it into a graph, and now you sort of got a messaging graph saying like, oh, these people are messaging these people, and it doesn't get confusing at all, <laughs> because graphs make the problem a lot, fa a lot more simple to uh, illustrate. So it looks something like this instead of just a bullet point list. And um, so the algorithms you can use here are, uh, yeah, how do you determine like who's actually in charge of this network? There's a lot of different algorithms for this. Uh, there's sort of two classes is articulation points, which sort of tell you what node or edge you can remove to uh, separate the graph completely from each other, like basically turn it into two graphs, two separate graphs, or one disconnected graph. Um, those are great if you have a point like that, um, but those don't always exist. So um, another tool you can use is centrality which is just determining a node's influence. Um, I'm gonna use degree centrality because it's really easy to calculate. It's literally just counting the degrees per node. And so you can um, normalize it by n minus one, the number of nodes minus one. That's the maximum number of connections any node can have. And so that ends up looking like this. And so then you can take out someone that's uh, sort of at the center, a high influence person. There's a lot of other centralities. Degree centrality is just the most simple one. You definitely wanna look at other ones. Um, and so you go and you make more Batman noises and you get a big bag of money and you go to the mayor and they're like, yes, this is great. I can finally fund the town, but I don't know how to distribute it. And this is our town charter and we have to fund all these things. And I don't know where to start. And so you can use community detection, which is another class of algorithms. I'm only going to go over prims because I have like zero time. But basically, um, you take that charter, and every, um, you know, every entity in the charter, you turn it into its own node. So you've got uh, you know, entity 1-1 one, one is the mayor, 1-2 is the mayor's aide, et cetera. And then you connect them by basically saying, oh, are they mentioned in the same uh, section of the charter? And then you can keep connecting them a little more loosely by saying, OK, you know, um, if, they're, if they're mentioned at all in the charter, that's uh, not as strong a connection, right? So I, I wanna be aware of that, and uh, I'm gonna uh, weight that connection by two to just sort of say like, oh, 
uh, these entities are a little more distant from each other, according to the charter. So then you have a uh, list of edges and um, their weight. And I actually, yeah, I ordered them by their edge weight because you need to for Prim's algorithm because you basically take out all the nodes and you start adding, uh, or you take out all the edges and you start adding edges back uh, to your graph uh, until you get what's known as a spanning tree. And that's what this looks like. You add an edge and then you add an edge and then you're just going through your, um, your ordered list of, of edges uh, ordered by weight. Um, but if you do that, right, you may end up getting a loop, which is uh, contrary to what a tree is, because we're trying to get a graph that has the minimum weight while still being fully connected. So we don't actually need this one. We can just remove that. Then we keep doing this process, and we end up connecting the graph with what's known as a minimum spanning tree. And then we can start um, removing uh, edges to uh, build out the community detection algorithm. And that is basically just going backwards until the desired number of groups is achieved. So we're going to take out the edge uh, AF and the edge BF. And now we have three communities, right? <clears throat> and we end up funding the, uh, uh, the mayor's office and the mayor's aid equally as much as water well maintenance, roads, animal crossing, fire, medical, and hazardous magic because uh, graphs are not a silver bullet. So um, one thing I did want to talk about is uh, you know, your algorithms only work uh, the way they're supposed to. And so if they, you should always ask yourself, what kind of results do I expect before running out any algorithm? Um, and this was, yeah, no, I'm not going to share that anecdote. That's fine. Uh, basically, you want to know what success and failure looks like before you run an algorithm, right? And if you don't get uh, results that you expected, check if it's implemented correctly. Uh, check if there's similar algorithms. I did mention there's a lot of community detection algorithms out there. Try it. And then um, lastly, redefine what a node or edge is, uh, because maybe this arbitrary relationship of you know, being in the same uh, paragraph of the charter, that doesn't really encode any useful information, right? So wow, I made it on time and still have time to spare. Great. Um, I practiced this like five times and thought I got it. But you know, when you're up here and the lights are shining, time doesn't matter. Um, but I just wanted to um, leave you guys with a few little things. Uh, graphs are great, and oh, can't cross your arms over the mic. Uh, they, they're really great because they encode systems as entities and relationships. Um, if you don't walk away with any other algorithm today, check out Breath for a search. It's really useful. You can use it for a lot of different things. Um, they're also very resilient to on-the-fly changes. You can add information to your graph or to any node or edge in your database. Um, without having to update the entire thing, without having to you know, rewrite schemas and stuff. The um, sort of three big classes of algorithms we went through are pads, connections, and communities. There's a lot of different stuff out there. So um, definitely check it out yourself. Uh, check out my link tree. It's got my um, GitHub on there that I thought I could populate between when my plane landed last night and now. But I will definitely have it populated later this week with uh, more resources for you guys to look through. Great. I can't believe I made it with time to spare. Look at that. You get five minutes of your life back. <laughs>